The Beavs looking to turn things around after a challenging first month, but doing that this week won't be easy. The Washington Huskies come to town this weekend with high expectations and their sights set on another playoff berth. What the Beavers need to do to pull off an upset? A brand new edition of Go Beavs starts now. to business at Reese or this weekend as the Beavers host the sixth ranked Washington Huskies coming up tomorrow night at 5 p.m. Beavers with plenty of time to rest and prepare for the bye. Uh, they certainly will need it as Washington has many weapons. <laughs> Welcome into Go Beavs, Amanda Maynard, Jason John Baptiste, uh, Lindsay Schnell with us. Uh, we're gonna have a deep dive on Washington's offense and defense, what you need to watch for a little later in the show, but we'll start by Oregon State coming off this bye. They should be well rested. What are you hoping to see tomorrow? Uh, I'm hoping to see Daryl Garrison, see how the offense, you know, reacts to him being the new quarterback and whether or not they're, they change out their offensive scheme. I think they're going to do a little bit more read option and be able to kind of run the ball a little bit more heavily with him being, well, they're going to have to run the ball a little right, more heavily. Right, because the downfield passing attack <laughs> right. might not be around. I'm most interested to see um, what's their demeanor. So we're a quarter of the way through the season. It's not going, excuse me, we're a third of the way through the season. It's not going like anyone anticipated. Right. So what does that look like going forward? What kind of energy do they play with? Washington is favored by 26 points. Does Oregon and state play like that right away or do they come out ready to surprise some people yeah absolutely and and last season the bye came at a really odd time it came really early in the season uh this seems to come at, at a more uh, yeah better part of the season when you yeah. are gonna face washington and then usc and then they get another one uh in mid-october after that colorado game uh what difference does a bye week make well for I mean, again, how does that change things for you? Well, I mean, it could have come at a better time. Uh, if, if I'm Oregon State and I'm uh, one of the coaches, if I'm GA, like, it, it couldn't have come at a better time because they needed, especially with Luton's injury, they yep. needed that time in order so that they could uh, work in Garrison into the uh, into the offensive scheme so they could change up that offense so they could, you know, cater to his abilities. So it couldn't have come at a better time. And on top of that, uh, defensively, you know, they've had – pretty good defensive games in the first half, but they've fallen off in the second half, so I think they could show up a lot uh, in the secondary and also with the pass rush as well, too. So. Yeah, I think one thing that kind of stinks is they do have a really good setup this year for their bye schedule, and we were thinking this could really help them, that it can help them get fresh, all those things when they're most going to need it, but if you're just bad, I'm not sure that it matters. <laughs> so hopefully, like you said with Garrettson, this is, if there's a good time for a quarterback to be lost this was probably it yeah and here's Joe Gerritsen on what the extra time has done for him well, I think the bye week definitely helped us out a little bit um, as far as getting the game plan down we get an extra week to game plan for the for Washington and uh, you know we're going up against dang good defense so uh, we just gotta we just gotta execute and do what we do and and, uh, and let the rest play out I tell you, a lot of guys were beat up you know including myself you know um, hard four games we had there before this bye week and I think it gave those two days two or three days off that we had you know it gave everybody time to recover you know kind of get your mind away from football a little bit but uh, I feel like it kind of helped everybody and now we're back and we're ready to go uh, I mean I think you kind of work on all facets of the game whether it's uh, whether it's a run or the pass or you know whatever it is um, you try to work on everything and with the bye week you get that amount of time so uh, so I wouldn't say there's one specific thing that we're working on but just overall we're working on everything so of course the big change this week is Daryl Garrettson in quarterback as Jake Luton recovers from that thoracic spine injury how are you gonna evaluate his play this week is he turning the ball over yeah. or not? Because yeah. that's been a problem. Yeah, I mean, and that's uh, actually, you took the words right out of my mouth, is how often are they turning the ball over? Um, Oregon State right now currently is one of the highest turnover ratios in the nation. So if he's able to not turn the ball over and able to move the ball down the field, I think that's a success story right that in, in and of itself right there. So, um, if it, you know, they're playing against a tough team. Washington is not going to be an easy team to score on. I mean, their defense is really, is really good. So if they're able to move the ball down the field, not turn the ball over, that's a win. I know that Kevin McGivin said that there won't be any wholesale changes to the offense, but what tweaks do you imagine we'll see? Because they're obviously very different quarterbacks. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the read option. I I'm telling you, like, and, and my... 
If I'm to assess Garrison and what he brings to the table, it's his ability to run the edges and be able to threaten the edges as a defensive player, um, which is something that Lewin could not do um, just because he doesn't have the foot speed for that. Um, so if I'm a defensive player, that's what I'm concerned with with him. So I think that that's something that they could definitely implement more so in the offense with him being at the helm. And as we talked about on Wednesday, the flip side of that is everyone's going to expect that because people know that. You know, it's we talked about this when Connor Blount came in last year that no, oh wow, he did great. Well, no one knew who he was. People right. didn't even yeah. know. The right. announcers right. didn't right. even you know. know. So th this is different. People are familiar with Garrettson. They know what he can do. So you got to establish the run early. That yep. will take so much pressure off of Garrettson. Yeah. How, how comfortable are you with him back there? I mean, obviously he knows the system. Uh, you know, started six games last year and had kind of an, an up and down road. <laughs> they don't have a choice. Oh, well, <laughs> no, I just want to know your person. Excellent point, Dick. I'm going to know what to uh, You know, <laughs> so here's the thing. I mean, um, this isn't anything new for him. I mean, he's been there, done that. You know, and as a D1 athlete and as a D1 quarterback, if you've done it before, uh, you're, you're expected to be able to do it, you know. So, um, as a player, you know, is he is he the person that I would want in that position? If Lewin was healthy, probably not. But he's not healthy. Lewin isn't healthy. Garrison's the next man up mentality. So I'm expecting him to play well and do well. Okay, and how about this? Garrison never really lived up to expectations last year, even before he got injured, even when he was starting. Maybe he does now. Maybe sure. he's a surprise. Yep. A lot of people yep. were excited about him. Yeah. Maybe he shows why. All right, well, still to come on the show, the Huskies have a beast on the defensive line. He is the freak athlete. If you want a definition of a freak athlete, you point at this man and just get out of his way because that dude is insane. And right around the corner, Mike Parker joins us to talk about how dangerous this Huskies team can be in the punt return game. Back here on Go Beavs, or an Oregon State punter, Nick Perebski, landing on the Campbell Trophy semifinalist list this week. One of 181 players across college football up for the award, given each year to the player believed to be the top scholar athlete in the sport. Bring in Mike Parker from Corvallis for more on the Washington Huskies. And Mike, uh, this team especially dangerous in the punt return game. Dante Pettis, three touchdown punt returns for touchdowns this year. Uh, how good? Is, how good is he back there? And what can we expect come Saturday? As good as anybody that's ever returned punts in college football. I mean, he has eight career. The longest of those eight, unfortunately, was at Reeser Stadium two years ago in his first trip here when he went back for 89 yards. He's just just an unbelievable talent and must be factored in. You can't just kick the ball away to him and say, ah, well, we're not going to concern ourselves with that. Gary Anderson is well aware there has to be a strategy involved when it comes to the great Dante Pettis. Well, I think obviously no one's going to sit in here and say that we're just going to kick the ball right to him. Um, we'll try to get it away from him as much as we can. He's a talented but kid. Now, he's a big, long levered kid that can cover to distance, turn. too. So if you're going to get it away from him, <clears throat> it has to be a pretty good kick to get it away from the kid. So, um, you know, we'll scheme it up. The key is to get the ball in the air. He is very, very, very calculated on uh, his opportunities when they're going to come his way. And um, he's unselfish, too. If it's not there, he's not going to force it, which is, uh, which is a really good thing. Out of that kid, so he makes some good decisions when he's back there, but he is no doubt special, special, special when it comes to um, returning those punts. He has a knack for it, and you know, he's got some good people in front of him that are holding guys up on line of scrimmage and, and giving him a couple creases. So ideally, you don't want him to have his hands on the ball, and if he does, you want him to uh, wave his hand over his head before he catches it and gets it in his hands. Nick Perebski's had a bit of an uneven season, as you know, Amanda, and so it's important for Nick, as Gary said, to get that ball, hang it high, and at least get Dante to wave his hand over his head for a fair catch. That would be a big triumph in the punt return game this weekend. And Pettis, obviously their top receiver as well. They lost their second uh, leading receiver, Chico McClatcher, to a season-ending injury. Uh, how much more do you expect them to, to lean on Pettis this week, and is there anything do to, that the Beavers defense can do to kind of slow this guy down? Well, he, he is, as Coach Anderson, I think he went triple special there. Special, special, special talent and kid. So Pettis is going to make his catches and Quentin Pounds kind of coming up behind Chico McClatcher made a tremendous catch against Colorado. Lenius had two touchdown receptions against the Beavers at Reeser two years ago. Miles Gaskin coming off a 202-yard rush game. Uh, Jake Browning in that offense, there's weapons all over the field. Dante Pettis is perhaps the 
cheap of them, but the Beavs have their hands full with everybody else, too. So look at McClatcher's numbers for this season. 10 catches, 128 yards this season. No touchdowns, but obviously has been a critical part of the offense. We're welcoming back in Lindsay and Jason to talk a little bit more about the receiving core. Uh, and why don't we start by talking a little bit about Dante Pettis. Yes, because Jason had some made a really good point when things. we were watching. Mike. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what were you noticing when he runs? Because no, he doesn't he, look that fast. No, he, he doesn't, but he runs so smoothly. And he's picked, like, you could tell that he's chunking up a lot of yards with his smoothness and when he takes a step. Kind of reminiscent of a Randy Moss kind of type, where it's like, oh, he's not running that fast. Wait, he's running really fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's long and lanky. Uh, I mean, he, he, yeah, he covers a lot of ground with a minimal amount of uh, steps. So. The thing that I love watching him in returns is he's pointing. He, he communicates so well with his teammates, his blockers. He's pointing at guys, go here. He knows he has a plan. Right? Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. How much more do you feel like they will rely on Pettis? I mean, obviously Washington has an amazing stable of people behind McClatcher, but with McClatcher out, how big of a loss is that, and, and how much more do you think that they'll rely on Pettis? You know, he'll he'll have to be the big play guy. Yeah, exactly. In the way that Ross was last year, when they needed a critical first or third down, they went to Ross, then they would go to Chico sometimes. They'll go to Pettis even more now. They also, they decided to not redshirt a true freshman, Ty Jones, who's been playing really well in practice not sure how many snaps he's gonna get but that'll be huge for them going forward too yeah and, and in terms of this game I think it really is uh, dependent upon how well Crawford could cover him because if you know um, he's able if Paris is able to get open and be able to take advantage of Crawford then they're gonna continue going to him but if that's not the case then they're gonna have to find different ways to you know get yards from different players Huskies have a pretty potent running game as well the running game uh, centers on Miles Gaskin uh, the junior broke out for over 200 yards against Colorado last week what makes him special a look at that in our Buster's barbecue Q&A Gaskin and he's in. Gaskin's got the corner. Gaskin has the end zone. Physical, physical. You know, all the defensive guys I talk to him about him, you know, they say he's downhill, he'll hit you, you know, not afraid of contact. No, he's a scat back, but he kind of like a power back, so he can do a lot of things. He got a good jump cut. Uh, he's fun to watch, you know. He's a very good player. You know, we got a game plan him and stuff like that, so we got to be ready for him this season. <laughs> I love the way he plays. I mean, people talk about he's five foot nothing, and it, that, none of that matters. It doesn't, it really doesn't matter. He, he runs that ball hard, and, um, I, I like the way he moves in the backfield. He's, he built a name for himself. They they did they rushed all over us last year, and so they did it in a, a kind of weird way. It wasn't like all the way outside, but it wasn't up the middle. They found a way just to just to bend our edge and had good blocking on the perimeter. I, I think that he's definitely established himself too. I mean, there's some powerful backs in this conference. So Gaskin season by the numbers. He had a pretty quiet start, 153 yards in three games, but that totally changed last week. 202 rushing yards against the Buffs. Is he the best running back in the Pac-12? Or where does no, he stack no. up? No. <laughs> Have you seen Bryce Love from Stanford play who leads the country in rushing yards <laughs> per game? Also, was, yeah, Royce Freeman, so it was pretty good. I was going to say, I would argue <laughs> Freeman's better also. This is a Beaver show, no, though. No, you can't no, give no, credit was, there. Yeah, no, no, it's pretty, it's pretty I mean, darn good, too. Royce Freeman was a dark horse Heisman candidate last yeah, season. So. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Gaskin's good. The big thing is that, and we talked about this a little bit on Wednesday, they have a good balance. You know, they that's do. huge. So he is not putting up insane numbers right now, but he can if necessary. Yeah. And, a, and a nice thing about him, too, is that he also uh, catches the ball out of the backfield. So, he, you know, he's a three down back. Uh, he's small in stature, but runs really hard. He's quick. Uh, he reads his linemen uh, really well as well. Um, so, I mean, he's, a, he's an all around back, which is, you know, nice to have when you have a balanced offense like they do. So how do they slow him down? Um, they hit him and they hit him hard and often, <laughs> early and often. That's how you slow him down. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that um, uh, except for the game last game, I mean, he's only been averaging 88 yards uh, a game. So he hasn't had the type of season that I'm sure that he envisioned yet. Um, that said, the Beaver defense also hasn't had the type of season that they've mentioned yet either. Amen. So, um, you know, it's gonna. We'll see. We'll see what happens. We we'll talked to happens. on Wednesday. Levon Coleman, his backup, is also you know a threat to do something at any point. Um, to me, when you say like, what can the Beavers do to stop him? I, I don't see a lot of weaknesses with Washington yeah. across the board. So 
If Washington makes a mistake, you have to take advantage of it. Absolutely. That's the biggest yeah. thing in the Absolutely, game, in yeah. My opinion. Yeah, they're the number six team in the nation for a reason. Yeah. All so. right, the Beavers defense certainly have their hands full with also uh, one of, if not the best quarterback in the Pac-12. We'll discuss what they're up against there. And up next, a look at the top sports stories of the week with Lindsay. Well, this is exciting. Oregon State students at Saturday's game have a chance to win a year of free tuition. Ten students who downloaded a ticket to the game will be randomly selected to compete for the prize during halftime of this weekend's game. No word on what that competition exactly is, but uh, good luck to all those involved. Time now for our standard TV and appliance headlines with our veteran reporter of USA Today, Lindsay Schnell. And this first one is all about Gary Anderson, uh, somebody having his back, right? Getting some support. So the Oregonian sat down with new Oregon State Athletic Director Scott Barnes this week and Barnes says we have the right leader in place he is backing Anderson 100% you know of course Barnes and Anderson have a long history they were at Utah State together before this Anderson was very influential in bringing Barnes out all the way to Corvallis so this is good you know a lot of people have been restless in Beaver Nation with this like dreadful start that no one anticipated so big got to be a big sigh of relief for Gary Anderson. Do you feel like as the season progresses, if there is not progress, that minds will change? Or you think at least this year? I think that, year well, okay, first of all, they're locked into a contract with him uh, for quite a while. So I, I believe through 2020, at least? Mm -hmm. 2021, 2022? Significant it's, amount of money. Yeah, That's it's safe. a lot of money that Oregon State doesn't have to pay him out. So he has his back. You know, uh, important to remember that it took four years for it to flip at Washington State. I would like to say, though, that he, Scott Barnes said nothing about having the backs of the assistant. Okay. Particularly the defensive coordinator. All right, something to watch. Okay, next one, all about from Chris Peterson, right? What he's saying. Yes, you gotta love Chris Peterson up <laughs> at Washington. You know, he just does not suffer fools and he doesn't have much of a filter. So, as you know, this weekend the Beavers are gonna play one of the top teams in the country and they are up there not just in the rankings but statistically. And meanwhile, the Beavers are at the bottom of that. The Beavers, for example, are 127th out of 130 teams in the NCAA in scoring defense allowing 47.5 points per game but Chris Peterson's response to this is that stats are for losers and <laughs> he does not pay attention to that his team does not pay attention to that it does not matter that they are that Oregon State's about to go up against the single most efficient offense in NCAA football Peterson says you can make stats to work for you however you want so he's not buying it okay and number three is all about this college basketball scandal right I know it's you've been working hard this week on this of course this college basketball scandal so I thought Oregon State fans probably breathed the sigh of relief Tuesday when this all that when this news came out because in all honesty if your team hasn't been winning a lot you don't need don't have a lot to be worried about and as you see Wayne Tinkle posted this shortly after news broke proud of our entire team department institution for doing things the way we do go Beavers clearly Amanda he's making a reference to programs that are not doing the right thing including as we talked about on Wednesday two assistants in the Pac-12 one at USC one in Arizona who were arrested earlier this week. Well, and as we talked about Wednesday too, who knows what effect that has on the upcoming season, whether or not those hood coaches are there as well, right? Yeah, well, the October 12th, the day of Pac-12 Men's Basketball Media Day, October 12th and 13th, will be here very soon, and I think there will be a lot of interesting questions for Sean Miller in Arizona and Andy Enfield at USC. All right, plenty more to come here on Go Beavs. Right now, Evanson is getting ready for the weekend's game at the OSU Beaver Store. Hey guys, we're here at the OSU Beaver Store on campus. We're in the ladies section. Ladies, check this out right here. Long hem shirt, you can wear it with your leggings, with your skinny jeans, and uh, not only that, you can wear it every day of the week if you want, not just game day. It's similar, but it's not a button down. Look at this, it has a little bit of the Burberry flair to it. Looks real good. Here we are in the men's section. Fellas, check this out. Nice button up right here. You can wear it to the workplace and represent your OSU Beavers. And then we have a plaid right here. Love it. That's what I got on, right? So you better buy it since I got it on. Just kidding. <laughs> and over here, we have your casual look. Look at that, the denim. You rock the denim on denim, AKA Canadian tuxedo with your cowboy boots. It's a great look, I love it. Your wives and your girlfriends will love that right there. Get all your gear at the OSU Beaver Store. Band start here.
The Huskies eyeing a return to college football playoff. Right now, they're ranked sixth in both the AP and coaches poll. No surprise, they are major favorites in this one tomorrow. 26 and a half points. So can the Beavers trip them up? Jordan Villeman says the secret to turning things around is simple. You just got to look ahead. Like You got to look on the brighter side. You can't just dwell on the past. Like That's what I learned from being here for five years you know like there's got to be up and ups and downs you know i mean you just you can't dwell on either so it's just like if something bad happens like you're just like now you have one day to you have one day to be depressed and then the next day it's over with because like you, you you really can't you really not supposed to be depressed the next day because like you, you can't do nothing to go back in time so i mean it's just like you just got to get over it and you got to go next week work just as hard to try and like flip things around you know what i'm saying and then you just got to keep your head focused like that's all it is what's been most surprising to you would you say about this start to the year uh, it just feels like 2015 for, for a little bit in the beginning of it, and you know, and I know the team kind of felt that, but I know it's changing. I, I feel it in the locker room, so I know I'm not worried about these last four games. Like, it's in the past. I know what my team is focused on. We had a bye week. Everybody got everybody everything focused, so I mean, we just ready to go out there and have fun. Welcome back to Go Beavs. Amanda Maynard, Jason John Baptiste, Lindsay Schnell. Schnell, Schnell of, it's a Friday night, guys. <laughs> Lindsay Schnell of USA Today. Uh, guys, hearing what Jordan Villeman says, also Coach Anderson this week saying he wants his team to have fun again. Yeah. How important is that, you think? Oh, it's huge. Um, you know, as a team that is struggling right now and not winning as many games as, as they would like, um, it's important to not lose sight of what this game is all about. Um, we all started playing this game because we loved it. We love, you know, the fun of it and the camaraderie. So even though you're losing, it's important to still have fun because what will end up happening is that you'll, you'll have fun, but also you'll still uh, maintain that competitiveness and hopefully have more competitive games. What I appreciated that Gary said um, in conjunction with that is understanding that he sets the tone. You yeah. know, he's like, I, I can't be in a bad mood constantly. The players will pick up on that, and that's so true. And we talked on... I think we talked on Wednesday about this. Certainly we've talked about it on past shows with Evanson, who played for Mike Riley and adores Mike Riley, that that was something Riley was always really good at. And that's what coaches in general are good at. You know, players still know that they need to win and they understand yeah. that Gary's competitive, but if he's just in a bad mood, kids aren't going to respond to that, and yeah. he knows that. Yeah. So as we said, 26 and a half point underdogs, but this program obviously has a long history of giant killing. We're going to look at some of those notable upsets there. Which of these jump out to you? I know, again, obviously, Jason, you played. Lindsay, you went there. You guys have been around for a lot of these. Yeah. I mean, the, the SC wins were huge. Were huge. Yeah. And, and here's why they were huge. It's, it's important to think about a couple things. So when they beat SC in 2006 um, uh, with John David Booty as the oh, USC yeah. quarterback, yeah. Um, that was big. It was dad's weekend. And that was this moment for these generations of Beaver fans yep. that they got to so, celebrate together. Cool. It was amazing. I'll never forget. Uh, everyone rushed the field. I was there. My dad was with me in the press box that day. Yeah. It was just incredible. Then, two years later, when they win, when Quiz is a freshman, first of all, I did not you think that they would game. win that game at all. Yeah. I, I had a really bad cold that week, and I sat at home. My apartment was two blocks from campus. I could hear the game two blocks away when they won. I well, felt awful. Yeah. But here's why it was big. I just want to say this. It was a primetime game on Thursday night. Exactly. Everyone that's what was yeah. 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 That played yeah. a role in getting some bigger recruits to Corvette. Absolutely. And not a single it. person, I could tell you, not a single person truly believed that no, Oregon State was going to win that game. Definitely not. a not. single person. And, and not only that, but the, uh, the SC game in 2006, what made that game even better, was that it was a night game, and it was super foggy, and it was just like this kind of like mysterious, kind of yeah. like mystique that came over mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the stadium, and, and they played really well, and it was just like... And like this weird whole things I mean, happen, like exactly. Sandy Strada returned a punt for yeah. a touchdown. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, the, what's crazy is when Quiz was a freshman and they won, they ran the same play. They ran a stretch play over and over and over and over and over again. And SC would not come out of their defense. And Pete Carroll said afterward, this is entirely my fault. The kids wanted to come out of this defense. I wouldn't do it. And we just got beat. But my favorite part was that is that there's this iconic picture of Quiz looking up at a defensive lineman who's maybe two feet taller than him <laughs> talking so much yeah, trash. Yeah, just yeah, endless amounts yeah. of trash. No, it, was, it, was awesome. it was a, it was a coming out party for Oregon yeah. State. And that's what needs to happen this week. Well, I, I mean, is there any common denominator, you guys? I mean, obviously, some of these had a lot of the same guys on it. But when you look back at those upsets, I mean, what what went right? And, and do you see any of 
that potential in this team. Corvallis has historically been a hard place for some teams yeah, to, to win. Tra yeah, to travel to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah especially, it's a weird place to travel yeah. to. You don't stay in Corvallis. Right, and especially uh, with being a night game as well. Yeah. Like, a lot of teams have a difficult time with uh, traveling and playing at night in Corvallis. Um, and again, there's the factor of being the underdog. You know, once again, Oregon State will be our underdog uh, heavily, like a heavy underdog in this game. So they have nothing to lose. You know, you'll be playing with a new quarterback. Uh, I mean, I know he's been, uh, Garrison was a quarterback last year, but still for this year, he's, the new, uh, he's a new quarterback. So um, to a certain extent, Washington really doesn't know uh, what to expect. They kind of know, but they don't. So um, they have nothing to lose. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, I think that, you know, right now it doesn't look great for Oregon State to win another game this season, but because everyone thinks that, they'll probably catch someone. Right? Yeah. I don't know if it's going to be the number six team in the country. <laughs> <laughs> or five, but, you know, there's always hope. Yeah. All right, coming up a little later in the show, the Beavs versus Browning. What Oregon State needs to do to stop one of the conference's big QBs. And coming up next, a look at one of the Huskies' biggest literal Yeah, he's a freak ball. athlete. Uh, you know, I think I like him on game day during, during practice. kind of sucks, but, you know, I think he's obviously a really special player, really special talent. Pressure. He backs off. This is Calhoun right into a stack. And a bunch of gold helmets swarm. Once again, pressure off the edge, and they get to it. And Phillips loses the football. The area knocked it out. Gets rid of the ball, and it's intercepted. And that's broken up. Comes Burkhurgan on the blitz, and he gets there. The third sack of the game. They say defense wins championships, and the Huskies' defense has been pretty impressive over the first four weeks. They are second in the conference in total defense. A big reason for that is the hulking Vita Vea. He's a special guy in terms of how big and how much quick twitch he has. I mean, he just, you don't, you know, he's, he's, he is this really big, large individual, you know, and has small ankles, you know. He, you don't see that a whole, a whole lot. And with that comes this really elite movement skill. He's still learning the game and getting better. And so it's exciting to see what he can, he can get done. Yeah, he's a freak athlete. Uh, you know, I think I like him on game game day during, during practice kind of sucks but you know I think he's obviously a really special player really special talent and uh, you know somebody that's really stepped up to even to a leadership role and and uh, worked hard and just kind of been the example of you know here's how you need to work and you know everybody's talking about him being you know this draft pick this or that and you know he's not focused on it he's just I want to get better he is the freak athlete if you want a definition of a freak athlete you point at this man and just get out of his way because that dude is insane um <laughs> yeah man I I don't really know what to say. He's fast, he's big, and he's relentless. And uh, he's been working on his motor, so he got a few gears to go. But that dude is ready. So a breakdown of the Huskies' defense in our Toyota of Portland opponent preview. Uh, so some of the, the des descriptive words or, or descriptive phrases I saw when talking about Vita Veda, it was he runs as fast as a linebacker. He cuts like a running back. <laughs> How scary is this guy? He also uh, he's, he's just, massive, too. Look at their, okay, so I was confused by this when I went and looked on their stats. He has a punt return because he blocked a punt this year and then picked it up and returned it. Like, that's crazy. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, yeah. First yeah. Um, this was huge for them. A lot of people thought he was going to leave early. You know, it was big when he decided to come back, and they lost so much defensively. Uh, he's huge. And to me, the biggest thing is that their defense statistically is not great necessarily right now. Like, they don't lead the country in a bunch of stuff, but they can do a lot when necessary. Yeah, and, I mean, they have some talented players uh, defensively. I mean, when you have someone like him who could uh, take up two three offensive linemen and, and really keep those linebackers clean to make plays um, is huge. Especially like in the run game, uh, obviously he's a force also in the pass, in the pass in rushing the passer as well too. So here's someone who is talented and has a unique skill set as a defensive tackle in order to take up blocks, but also is uh, athletic enough to actually make plays and not just take up you He's know, more athletic than Steven Pio was, but to give people an example of mm -hmm. that, uh, we were talking about this off camera about part of why Pio was so good is that he demanded at least two offensive yeah. linemen, and maybe if you had a third you could send, that was good too. Yeah, absolutely. 
absolutely. So this defense, they lost three guys in the secondary. Obviously, very good guys. Uh, Lindsay, I know you you I did a whole Buda thing Baker. about Buda Baker. <laughs> um, I mean, is there any holes? Is there anything that this team can exploit that you think the Beavers, you know, change up? No, because yeah. Chris Peterson is a defensive coach. Yeah. Like that's part of why Boise was always so good. You know that you covered yeah. Boise yeah. State. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. They had a lot of great defensive guys. Yeah, I mean, and he does. And, and the thing with him too is that he does a great job recruiting. So I mean, like for them, it's like you know, it's just the next man up and kind of like regrouping. So they're really you know, deep. We talked yeah, about the, that on the they, they, they are deep, and and uh, so I don't think there's much uh, for them to really take advantage of because it's, you know they're they're solid. You know, so you just hope that uh, they play well and are able to win you know specific matchups every once in a while and move the ball and hopefully you know they have their best game in the season from the um, Oregon State offensive side of the ball. And obviously you're talking about it just those guys plugging up the middle. How do you get the run game going when you have so much size in there? Yeah, confusion. I think uh, confusion will, will play a major role in that. Uh, if you get them uh, thinking one thing and then uh, are able to you know, uh, trick them and, you know, maybe some speed options and, sure. and things like that uh, will definitely um, impact that and hopefully be successful. That fly sweep, right? We keep fly waiting sweep. for... Yeah. <laughs> I, who's going to run right. the fly sweep? They're they said our peers. Tiny... Our yeah. peers, okay, maybe. maybe. Well, we'll see. Bradford. We'll see. All right, we'll still to come, our analysts break out their ingredients to victory and part of that centers on the battle of the running backs. And after the break, will there be any additional assistance in the running game this week? Will we see Thomas Tyner? As preparation is spectacular. Um, I know everybody talks about that in terms of their quarterback. I mean, you can't even, you know, that's the price of doing business. You got to have this unbelievable work ethic. But I think there's certain guys that take it to another level and, and not just putting hours in to put hours in, but the way they approach it in this mindful, purpose, purposeful way. I think he's one of those guys. Jake Browning, the highest rated passer in the Pac-12, almost 70% completion rating so far this year. Nine touchdowns to two interceptions. As we talked about on Wednesday, he doesn't make a lot of mistakes, uh, but like you said, you're going to have to make him pay when they do. Uh, how do the Beavers try to, what, what do they try to do against him? Pressure him. Yeah, if you, can, if you can hit a quarterback a little bit, it gets in his head quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, you, you unravel him. Uh, his, his, he does get a chance to set his feet if, if he's really, like, busy in the pocket meaning that he's you know he's moving around and he can't check for his uh, you know his outlets and check uh, you know his reads that's exactly what you want to do with someone like him you want to get him out of his comfort zone because when he's comfortable he's deadly and obviously, Coach Pete said stats are for losers, but, I mean, if you look at his stats, stats what, what, uh, not, yeah, well, yeah. Well, he doesn't have a, uh, it doesn't appear statistically to have many weaknesses. Yeah, he doesn't I, throw a lot of interceptions. That, That's right. the thing. He doesn't give the ball away. And I, and I love the fact that uh, Coach Peterson uh, said, you know, stats are for losers when your stats are so good. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. You get to say that, right? Yeah, he's not losing. So how about if your stats aren't that good and then you say that? I don't think you'd be saying that so much, right? I mean, he's only saying that because his stats are so good and he doesn't want his uh, his players to have an overly inflated ego sure. and you know so I get that it's kind of cool too like Jake has a special connection to Oregon State his dad played at Oregon State and his dad's oh look at that throwback picture that. was against look at that mustache Washington. <laughs> <laughs> right. I like the Benny the Beaver oh yeah. man the logo it's yeah so this is it. you know he's just he's a kid that was kind of groomed to be like everyone knew he was going to be a stud you know it's important to remember too that the Pac-12, they have it's the collection of the best quarterbacks in the country. Absolutely, him, no doubt. Luke Falk, Josh Rosen, yeah. uh, who am I forgetting? Justin Hubert. Herbert, yeah. yep. uh, obviously Sam Darnold at yeah. USC. So, yeah. you know, we talked. Is he the best quarterback in the Pac-12? I, I don't know, but he could start for a lot of teams around the country. Yeah, yeah. Sure. It's so, I mean, it's so deep and so talented, you know, in the Pac-12. So, um, it's quite the sight to see, you know. So. I love it. All right, we're going to take a look at the injury list for uh, the Beaver this weekend. And no surprise, Jake Luton on there, still out. Uh, but Thomas Tyner upgraded to probable. I know he's been dealing with that hamstring injury. Uh, who, what kind of stands out to you about the injury report? And, and is Thomas Tyner kind of the, the biggest positive? Does any of the, the people that are out doubtful uh, concern you? Gosh, you know, with Tyner, I just have to say, everyone was so excited, you know, including the three of us, I think, about yeah. him coming back because it's cool. just a great story. I really hope that he can play, he can get healthy, play some meaningful snaps. He's had 
hamstring injuries, which th that was a problem for him at Oregon. It was a problem for him in high school. I think it has a lot to do with the amount of sprinting he's done along with playing football. Uh, I just don't know if he's going to do anything. And I don't mean that as a knock on him at all, just... I don't know how he works I mean, his way into the rotation. Yeah, I mean, he's been gone for, I mean, he took a whole year, almost two, two years. years. Sure. Two years, sure. Two years off. That's a long time. So, I mean, that's a long time. When you guys, you, when, when I go to the playing. gym for like two oh. weeks, I feel it. I mean, yeah. It's <laughs> hard. Yeah, I mean, and so that's a long time. But also, again, um, I don't want to minimize, obviously, we've been talking about uh, him a lot, but Jake Luton uh, injury, too. You know, where are the offensive players mentally um, after losing yeah, him. Sure. I mean, it was an uh, emotional time when he got he went down. So are they able to uh, regroup and uh, be able to, you know, uh, move the ball down the field offensively with Garrison? And uh, we'll, I, I assume Luton will be there on the sideline, but that's in, yeah, that'll be interesting, interesting to watch, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, coming up next, our ingredients to victory. Our analysts tell you exactly what they're looking for for the Beavers to pull off the upset. And don't forget, CSN has you covered throughout football season for all of your Beavers needs. Talking Beavers airs Wednesdays at 7, Inside the Huddle Thursdays at 10 p.m., and then, of course, Go Beavs Friday nights at 9. Well, research should be rocking in just under 24 hours as Oregon State welcomes in the undefeated Huskies. It's time now for our... Papa John's ingredients to victory, but uh, we gotta. We had to carbo load as well to get ready for this show, and there we are eating our Papa John's. A Philly cheesesteak, a new pizza from Papa John's, was uh, incredibly popular. <laughs> Got your garlic sauce on there. Oh you got yeah. Your Philly. Yeah, you Jason is. See, I, I was digging He's got in. Oh yeah. So oh yeah. And just, dig in. <laughs> just remember, you win the follow. If the Beaver score a touchdown in the game, uh, you win the following Tuesday with Papa John's touchdown Tuesday. Is the promo code Beaver Seven for fifty percent off your online order. And we are getting to our ingredients. Uh, Lindsay, let's start with your ingredients. Your ingredients to victory. Well, I just thought of another one that we didn't write down. Oh. So I apologize to our. So she's got producer. multiple more. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> my, my big ones, though, are you, this is the most uh, efficient offense in the country in UW, so you got to make them work to get into the end zone. See if you can tire the offense out a little bit. That helps. And then, you guys, no more turnovers. I don't want to see anyone giving the ball away. The other thing, this is the first game with students back on campus because classes started this week. Uh, students have to be loud. you got to bring some. I understand that it's been a frustrating start of the season, yeah. but you have to make Reese a tough stadium to play in. Yeah. How, how big of a difference does it make when students are back on campus? Oh, my campus? God. Oh, man. Yeah. Deal, right? well, Dallas That's increases by like 20,000 <laughs> yeah. people. And, and plus it gives it gives the stadium energy, right? Because I mean sure. like uh, when when school's out and you have like an older crowd there, old, like the environment is <laughs> not the same. Uh, oh, well, it's true, it's true, it's true. I mean, you know, having like, having the students there, having like the student sure. body there, people that you know, you're like, hey, give a shout out to yeah. them as you, as you go on and, the field. And, and like Evanson said, that. I want to yes. know if you agree with this. He said, it's really hard when you lose games you're walking around campus because you have uh, Absolutely, the absolutely. Like, Why do you guys Especially, suck, yeah, it's right? like, yeah, like, dude, you didn't make that tackle? Like, you couldn't score that touchdown? Like, uh, you know, yeah, you yeah, impress absolutely. your friends. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. you know, their pride will be yeah. hit a little this exactly. week, and that'll exactly. be good. Yeah. All right, Jason, what are you looking for? What are your um, ingredients? You know, for me, one of the things, is uh, obviously, is that I think Noel has to outplay Gaskin. Um, Gaskin, again, like I mentioned earlier, is averaging 88 yards uh, per game. Nall, on the other hand, has to have like a monster game if they're even going to come close to being Washington. The second thing for me is that Xavier Crawford has to lock down Pettis. Um, he's going to be their number one target going in the passing game, um, deep threat. So if Xavier Crawford is able to minimize his playability, um, then I think they're, they'll be fine. And lastly, the last thing. It's a lot me, of ingredients. Do you want to? It is. Hey, look, but yeah, so three, a lot of things need to happen. A lot of things need to happen. Win, exactly. so. well, well, yeah. So they haven't. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> it distracted me. So the, <laughs> the, third, the third thing is the offense has to show up in the second half. Uh, Amen. Currently, currently the offense is being outscored 112 to 42 in the second half. So they have to I'm have the ability. It's on a bigger margin. So am I, so am I. So they have to be able to come in the second half, show up and play and, and be present, so. 
Going back, going back to the uh, the running back battle. Uh, obviously, coming into that last game, you know, Nall, they, they were still they were still, still trying to figure out how to yeah. work in Nall, work in Art Pierce. How do you think the carries shake out? Is it going to be back to Nall being the workhorse, or is Art Pierce going to get quite a bit of no, I th reps this I, week? No, I think I think Nall is going to be still the workhorse because uh, he'll be fresh. Yeah. Sure. You know, it's been yeah. good for him to have a weekend off. Someone that has taken so many carries over his OSU career, his body's pretty beat up, so it'll be good for him. Yeah, and and also I think they're um, they're still, you know, from a offensive standpoint, they're going to run the ball a lot. Um, so with that being said, Nall could take more carries than Pierce can, especially with the a physical defense which Washington is. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they're going to have to have someone that could hopefully wear down that defense, but also be able to, to maintain and, and take those hits, which is more Nall's category than than it is Pierce. So as we've mentioned, the Washington Huskies six. They're still trying to get back to the college football playoff again. Uh, they've lost, like we said, three starters in the secondary. Largely the same team, though. Do you feel like this Washington team is a college football playoff team? Yes. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. And the the interesting thing is that USC and Washington don't play each other in the regular season. A lot of people believe that they will meet in the Pac-12 title game, and there's yep. a good chance that the winner of that will go on to the playoff. I mean, obviously, let's call it Alabama's a lock. Um, Florida State is having a disastrous season, Clemson. so they're probably out. Clemson looks really, really good. good. Yeah. Uh, so I, I absolutely think that Washington is in it. Now, what's tough is that this, this is the year that the Big 12 is going to get a championship game so they're gonna have that extra game which has kind of been a knock against them the last couple years that they've been left out so your best bet in my opinion if you're the Pac-12 or you're the Big 12 is to go undefeated yeah through uh, through your conference play because if you lose it you don't have as much grace as you did before with the Big 12 and on the yeah. Big 12 note TCU looks like a yeah. team right now and, and uh, going with that with being undefeated in the Pac-12 I think you know USC has had some troubles I mean they they haven't not had very good clean games yet they're I mean, losing been, right now they're currently on, yeah State, for exactly say that. so uh, <laughs> so USC ha has been struggling uh, Donald hasn't been having the type of year uh, that we all thought that he would um, so so we'll see what, what ends up happening, um, but I think Washington, um, of the two teams, of the two universities, has been playing a little bit better than USC. Another thing that we talked about with Washington on Wednesday is uh, they're busy beating people by so much that their yeah. kids can sit out and they're well sure. rested. That's huge. Absolutely. Forward. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's hope that this isn't Big one game. of those games. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Big game for Oregon State tomorrow at 5. We'll be back here on Wednesday to wrap it all up for you. Talking Beavers airs Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Have a great night, everybody.